Hello everyone! This is the first of a series of videos dedicated to mass spectrometry and specifically to the biological applications of mass spectrometry. I will be discussing a little bit of the history of mass spectrometry, um, some of the key equipment that uh, you need to be familiar with when you're performing um, mass spectrometry. And I will also be talking about the use of mass spec in a biological context, specifically to study proteins and other important biomolecules, for example, DNA. I will also be discussing a little bit about the strengths and limitations of a mass spec as a technique to study uh, biological molecules. The history of mass spectrometry. Um, it was developed in the early 1900s and um, it, it, Thomson and Aston together constructed the first uh, mass spectrometer. Both of them got a Nobel Prize, by the way, although for different uh, reasons. Thomson was, um, got a Nobel Prize in physics for the discovery of the electron, and Aston in the, mid in the early 20s uh, also had a Nobel Prize, um, in his case, in chemistry. Um, this first mass spectrometer was quite basic, but soon it will it um, it evolved to um, to a better technique, and um, Aston contributed to improve um, this first model to to improve its resolving power, which meant that it could not only detect the mass of a compound, it could also allow the study of the different isotopic compositions of the of the compound. Those early designs were uh, improved by other people. In the late uh, 19th, 1910s, uh, Dempster, who was uh, an engineer, I think, developed um, a, the deflection area of the mass spec. Uh, and, and his original design is still the basis of the signs we use, uh, we use today. And he also um, developed the first uh, electronization, electron ionization source. And um, so this initial work uh, by Thomson and Aston was improved on, and this new mass spectrometer had a much better resolution compared with that, uh, that early design. This gentleman is called Alfred Niels, and he was an engineer, an electrical engineer, and um, his knowledge of, of building machines really, really helped improve those early versions of, um, of mass spectrometers. Um, in collaboration with another scientist, Johnson, he developed a mass spectrometer which had a combination of electrostatic and magnetic analyzers and, and, and to improve the design of creating the, the ions and, and deflecting the ions in the system. And he developed a high mass resolution instrument. So he was able, um, over the Second World War, he was able to isolate two isotopes of uranium, 235 from 238. Those early pioneers paved the, wor the, the work for that in the mid-40s, new equipment, improved equipment, uh, was developed. And Stephens uh, uh, proposed the first spectrometer based on a technique called a time of flight, so TOF MS, time of flight mass spectrometry. And this is an improved technique, a mass spectrometry technique that allows for a very rapid analysis and it has a high uh, resolution and a high accuracy. Um, Paul and Delmel, Delment, Delmet, uh, which by the way share a Nobel Prize in the late 80s, um, worked a lot in mass spectrometry too. And they developed a technique called the ion trap technique. And that means that it was possible, so with this technique, it's possible to study a single electron or a single ion with an incredibly high precision. Also, well, uh, Paul um, um, reported the first, he developed the first quadrupole mass filter um, that was in the mid 50s. And, um, and that is that's a system, a quadrupole ion trap can be used to separate uh, ions much more effectively. 
Um, new improvements came in the late 60s, 70s and 80s. Hippel developed something called um, ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry, which really improved the resolution and accuracy of the instruments. In the mid 70s, Komisarov and Marshall developed something called Fourier transfer ICR mass spectrometry. And, uh, and that uh, allowed many different ions to be measured at the same time. Also in the mid 70s, Arpino, Baldwin and Lafferty um, were the first ones to couple chromatography to a mass spectrometer. They couple a high, an HPLC um, to a mass spectrometer. And in the mid 80s, Giddings um, came with this idea of, with this, with this work on um, a multidimensional chromatographic separations, which was a, a new tool to identify the context of complex mixture. So this was in the mid 70s uh, mid to mid 80s, was when, was when the mass spectrometry was suddenly coupled to separation techniques, uh, chromatograph chromatographic techniques for example, an HPLC, and that allow, allowed to separate the compounds and then analyze them using a mass spectrometer. A very, very important step that allowed mass spectrometry that was used to identify um, molecules um, into a biological context, uh, identifying proteins or DNA, DNA large uh, molecules, biomolecules, was the development of what we call soft ionization techniques. And specifically two ionization techniques, which are at the moment still the most popular ones. One is called SCMS, Electrospray Ionization Mass Spectrometry, and the other one MALDI, matrix assisted desorption ionization. And that is typically combined with uh, time of flight. So MALDI TOF MS uh, and SCMS are the two main techniques used to measure, uh, to perform mass spectrometry in, um, in um, biomolecules. Well, the idea of like electrospray ionization was already proposed in the late 60s, uh, but it was not properly developed into, you know, the technique was not developed in a, in a working mass spectrometer until the late 18s uh, by Fenn, and he actually got a Nobel Prize in, in chemistry in the early 21st century for, for his work. And MALDI, a matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization, was also um, developed in the late 80s by this gentleman, Tanaka, who also got a Nobel Prize in 2002. And, um, and the use of laser uh, as ionization method for mass spectrometry. And that really, really helped, these two techniques really help blossom uh, mass spectrometry into a technique that could be used to study biomolecules, large molecules. The, um, the fact that these ionization techniques allow you to control the, the ions uh, created in the mass spectrometer. And I will talk about it later. With these new ions of ionization techniques, suddenly mass spectrometry entered the world of biological applications. Uh, protein studies, drug discovery, was used to study DNA, carbohydrate analysis and, use, and used in, in identifying biomarkers. So biological applications of a technique that until then had been mostly a, chemist, a chemical technique used to identify chemical compounds but not biomolecules. A very popular application of mass spectrometry in, bio, in a biological context is the study of proteins. And this can be done uh, by something called peptide mass fingerprinting. This is a technique that was developed uh, first in the, me, in the uh, early 90s. And Hensel and his team show that you can identify proteins uh, by a combination of a separation technique um, in his case, uh, 2D gel and um, a mass spectrometer. 
So um, pattern mask fingerprinting, um, you have a video in this slide and it's also available on the resources for uh, in that you have available on Blackboard and I really encourage you to, to watch this video to get a better idea what ma peptide mask fingerprinting is. As a, in general, it uh, involves um, the separation of a protein either using a 2D gel or for example using liquid chromatography. Then the separated protein is uh, um, uh, cut in uh, smaller peptide fragments, 8 to 10 amino acids by um, an enzyme, typically trypsin, although others can be used. Those fragments are then uh, go through a mass spectrometer, either a MALDI, TOF or an SE mass spec, and a series of mass spectra for each fr uh, peptide fragment are, um, are collected. Those are then compared with data from a database. If the protein is in a database, or if you have the genome and then you can put it in the database and the proteins can be identified, you can, you can do a theoretical cleavage of the, the, the protein in the database um, um, and that will give you the theoretical uh, frag peptide fragments you can extract from that protein and those can be compared with the real ones that you have obtained in the lab and then using some statistical analysis you can compare your obtained uh, mass spectra in the lab with the ones uh, available in the database and see uh, whether they match. It has the limitation that the protein has to be in the database, but a fingerprinting, you know, this is a very unique, those amino acid sequences are very unique to that protein. So it is possible to identify proteins using, using this technique, and that's what is called a uh, fingerprinting. And, um, you know, again, as I was saying, the technique was developed in the early 90s by different labs and, and, and we talk about peptide fingerprints or mass maps and that you can and it allow you to identify a protein using information from databases. And here is an example of one of them, mascot, that uh, you can use to search by, for peptide uh, mass fingerprints. You can also search uh, sequences and you can also do what is called MS-MS ion search. And I will talk about uh, the MS-MS uh, technique uh, later in another video.